Welcome back to my Lawyer's Corner. This is your corner where we give insights and nuggets into South African law and aspects that have to do with South African law. Just to give a bit of education to those that are would-be lawyers, um, those aspiring attorneys, those aspiring lawyers, and also society in general. It's also a platform that I want us to learn and grow from um, one another. I want us to teach one another. I want us to be engaging. Um, it's one that um, I want to share with everyone so that everyone learns, everyone grows, everyone basically knows their rights because a society that knows their rights is able to hold those in power accountable. Also, I want to cultivate um, a society that is in service for one another, like society that has people that are in service towards one another because that is how we create a better society and that's, those are the small things that we can do to create a better society for everyone. So without any further ado, today I want to talk about a topic that happens to more people than we actually know about. This is about disciplinary hearings, right? And I'm going to talk about the procedural fairness when it comes to disciplinary hearings. I'm not going to go into specific types of hearings such as performance hearings because depending on the type of um, hearing that is taking place, the procedure gets tweaked a little bit like in terms of there being further steps that could be added to the procedure um, but in general this is just a general overview in terms of the procedure that needs to be followed in a disciplinary hearing all right um, first things first there's a legal principle called the Audi principle the Audi principle is not talking about the car the Audi principle basically talks about the fact that both sides, both parties' sides need to be heard, right? The decision can only be fair when both parties' sides has been heard, both sides of the story has been heard. Now, in a disciplinary hearing similar, the Audi, the Audi principle applies. It cannot be that the employer party um, only gets to say their side of the story and the employee does not get to say their side of the story. The RD principle applies and both the employer and the employee must be afforded an equal opportunity to say their sides of the story. Now, first things first, um, at the very inception, before the hearing takes place, there's an important step that kickstarts the process and that is the notice, right? the notice to attend a disciplinary hearing. Now, the employee has to be given sufficient notice in order to attend a disciplinary hearing. There isn't anything in writing that um, stipulates what sufficient notice is. There isn't a law or, um, yeah, there isn't a law legislation that dictates what sufficient notice is. Is it five days? Is it two weeks? But generally, it has been accepted by the Labour Court as well as the CCMA that 48 hours constitutes sufficient notice for an employee to attend a disciplinary hearing, right? Now, from that point, that starts the process. Once the notice has been issued to the employee to let them know of the disciplinary hearing, the notice also needs to contain the employee's rights in terms of the disciplinary hearing. This is also important towards the procedure of the disciplinary hearing because if you're not informed of your rights, then it becomes a procedural flaw, right? These rights include the right to be represented at the hearing, the right to be present. Let's start with the right to be present at the disciplinary hearing. And also notice that if you are not present at your disciplinary hearing and it's taken that it was you, you were given sufficient notice to attend the hearing, the hearing may proceed without you. Okay? And that is a right that the employer has. Should they give you sufficient notice to attend your hearing and you choose not to attend your hearing, the employer has the right to proceed with the hearing in your absence. There's something here behind me that's distracting me. I don't know what this is. Probably something that my child was playing with. 
anyway that's fine let me just yeah maybe that's that's a bit better okay okay so if the employer has given you sufficient notice to attend your hearing and you choose not to attend your hearing the employer has the right to proceed with the hearing without you um, the right to be legally represented, not legally, but represented by an internal employee of the employer, that is a colleague, right? Because a disciplinary um, hearing is still an internal process, you may be represented by an internal employee of the employer, which is a colleague. There are instances where you can ask the employer, you can apply, basically ask the employer for permission to have an external party represent you such as an attorney but the employer does have the right to decline this because disciplinary hearings are still inter considered internal processes and um, the employer has the right to refuse that but with, with not not randomly refuse it they can't withhold the permission um, for arbitrary reasons like for random reasons right you also have the right to an interpreter should you not be fluent in English or should you not be comfortable in proceeding with the hearing in English, you have the right to have an interpreter at your hearing. You have the right to present evidence. You have the right to cross-examine and to question the evidence of the employer, right? Those are some of the rights that um, can be in should be included in the notice that is served on the employee to attend a disciplinary hearing. Um, under certain circumstances, different companies have included many other rights, right? Um, there are gray areas and you can, you can give the employee a right to resign um, should they wish not to proceed with the hearing. You can give the employee, the employee has the right to resign. I mean, that right goes without saying. At any point in an employee's employment, they have the right to resign for whatever reasons um, for whatever reason that they feel they, they want to terminate their employment you can even go a step further and say you have the right to resign with immediate effect meaning at me serving you this notice and you receive the notice and you choose to exercise your right to resign you don't have to serve any notice um, we will terminate your employment immediately upon your unilateral decision to terminate your employment being your resignation. Okay, so the notice has been served. This is now the day that the disciplinary hearing needs to proceed, right? The chairperson will then open the disciplinary hearing by introducing all the parties and saying what is the purpose of that meeting, right? They'll also go through your rights um, the chairperson's role in a disciplinary hearing is to be impartial. That means to be fair, not to be taking sides. A chairperson has to be neutral. They can't have had prior notice or prior knowledge of the facts that pertain to the matter at hand in the disciplinary hearing, right? Because that already clouds their judgment. So the chairperson's role is to be a neutral chairperson who is fair and impartial and is there to decide on a balance of probabilities the guilt or innocence of the employee right now depending on or let's 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 stick to misconduct like your theft your dishonesty your insubordination that's if you didn't take an instruction in um under those circumstances where those are the charges at the hearing the employer party will be the one who kickstarts the hearing, right? Once the charges are read and your rights have been explained, you have you still have to be asked, do you want an interpreter? Are you going to be represented? Were you given sufficient notice? And are you ready to proceed with the hearing, right? And now you say you're ready to proceed, right? The hearing starts. The hearing will start with the employer presenting their case, right? You under certain circumstances where the charges require or where or oh actually let's take it a step back now the charges have been read your rights have been explained in the disciplinary hearing you will be required to plead you will be asked whether you plead guilty or you plead not guilty to the charges at hand right 
and should you decide to plead not guilty or should you pre to decide to plead guilty the chairperson will then conduct an inquiry to ensure that you admitting all the elements that have been that you have been charged with um and accordingly find you guilty let's say you plead not guilty under those circumstances then the hearing starts with the employer presenting their case all right you can give an explanation as to why you're pleading not guilty thereby putting your defense out there or you can just say i don't plead i plead not guilty i don't plead guilty and i want to hear what the employer is saying i did what what are the what what are the evidence that they are relying on um to say that i'm guilty of this offense right the employer will proceed with either an opening statement or go straight into presenting evidence by evidence i mean they can call a witness they can produce a document they can produce um a video clip maybe there is video evidence or photographs that show how you committed the offense or how they're alleging that you committed the offense right and when they lead with their evidence in chief they ask open-ended questions if they're calling a witness they ask open-ended questions so as to not not so as not to put words in the witness's mouth the witness needs to explain and expand on how you allegedly committed the offense right and then you get an opportunity as the accused employee to cross-examine the witnesses of the employer and this process is followed with every witness that the employer will call similarly to when you as the employee party will call um, witnesses you will lead your witnesses once you have led your witnesses the employer party has the right to cross-examine them that same same principle that you would have the right to cross-examine the employer's witnesses so too does the employer have the right to cross-examine your witnesses uh, to poke holes in your case to disprove your defense um, now at the end of this process both parties employer and employee have the right to present closing arguments to basically summarize your case that has been presented to the chairperson right this is not an opportunity to place new evidence on record. This is merely an opportunity to summarize your case and highlight, basically put emphasis on the points that you want the chairperson to remember when making a suitable finding based on the evidence that has been presented. The chairperson will then collate all the evidence and make a suitable finding. The finding must be based on the evidence presented on a balance of probabilities whether the employee is guilty or not it can't be based on a random factor that um the chairperson found out outside of the hearing or the chairperson knows about this employee outside of the hearing the finding has to be suitable based on the evidence that has been presented at the hearing now say for example the chairperson brings out a finding of not guilty that is the end of the story the chairperson will then give you the minutes of the minute of the hearing and that is that right um say for example the chairperson finds the employee guilty then we need to go a step further because the chairperson will then need to hear evidence in aggravation or mitigate aggravation and mitigation of the suitable sanction now to aggravate means to make the circumstances worse to for the employer party to show the chairperson the aggravating factors that make the situation so worse or so gross or so bad that the chairperson has to consider a harsh sanction that is aggravation once the employer party has presented the aggravating factors it will be for the employee party to present the mitigating factors which are direct opposite of aggravating those are the factors that the chairperson will take into account to pardon the employee so as to not to give a harsh 
sanction under those circumstances and the circum and the the the, circum the circumstances will dictate what a suitable sanction could be it could be a dismissal it could be a written warning or a final written warning let's unpack a little bit the aggravating and mitigating factors aggravating factors could include factors such as whether this is not if if this is not the employee's first offense right against the company if the employee has other warnings that are still valid so say for example the employee is the employee today is it's a day in october it's the 13th of october and the employee on the 13th of june was issued a final or was issued a written warning that was valid for six months on the 13th of june 13 june 13 july august september october november december so an employee who is on sitting on a written warning that was valid for six months and is now found guilty on the 13th of october that is an aggravating factor because you are now found guilty of a further offense against the employer when you are already sitting with a disciplinary matter for with a warning that is still valid and similarly should the employee's track record be clean with the employer it would be a mitigating factor to say that this is the employee's first offense take leniency when um, imposing a suitable sanction right um, other aggravating factors would include that there has been several warnings against the employee the offense itself can be an aggravating factor right like gross insubordination that on its own is a dismissible offense theft against an employer that is a dismissible offense because it goes directly towards the trust relationship between employer and employee right um, offenses of that nature now mitigating factors include the fact that the employee has a clean track record has not committed any offenses against the employer other mitigating factors include that the the ser length of service with the employer if the employee has been employed with the employer say for example for 10 years and has not had any other issues um, is a trusted employee um, other factors include whether the employee is a breadwinner those are factors to take into account as mitigating factors now once the suitable sanction has been issued and the employee is not happy with the sanction the employee has a duty to exhaust all internal appeal um, processes before taking the matter on with the CCMA but that is not to say that the employee cannot directly take the matter to the CCMA once um, they are found guilty and issued a sanction either for an unfair dismissal if they have been dismissed or an unfair labor practice should the employee be of the view that the sanction given short of dismissal is grossly unfair or harsh um, that qualifies as an unfair labor practice right and the matter will then be taken to the ccma and adjudicated there on we'll touch on issues of matters that are taken to the ccma in further clips however i just wanted to wrap on the process of a disciplinary hearing and the importance of procedural fairness procedural fairness is of optimal importance because should the employer um mess up the process at any stage and the 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 sanction could really be fair the sanction could the sanction could the, the offense itself could be calling for that sanction to be given but should the procedure be fair, be flawed the matter will be it will be an unfair dismissal the ccma will find that it's an unfair dismissal based on procedural fairness and they won't even talk about the the substantive fairness being the reason for the dismissal because once the matter is procedurally flawed it's it's an unfair dismissal so procedures in disciplinary hearings are really really important and shouldn't be taken for granted by employers either because you can easily lose a case in the ccma just because your procedure was 
completely flawed right um that is that on procedural fairness uh when it comes to disciplinary matters and disciplinary hearings i hope that you have learned a thing or two and if i need to learn a thing or two please pop me a comment um i like engagement i really enjoy engagement and i really enjoy learning from um even more experienced lawyers um I'm, I'm happy that we are creating a growing community and this is exactly what i like to see remember to follow me on instagram as well at tseho underscore khailai um on tiktok i am tseho underscore khailai on twitter i'm tseho underscore mwash it's been real and i will see you on my next episode of my lawyer's corner